parasitoids. Uh, word of warning, some images will be gross. Uh, I have gone through them and removed the more, the more really picky ones, but there might be one or two that might make you look good. So as well. Parasitoids always kill the hummus, uh, usually when they're emerging or as part of the natural life cycle. For example, we have a textbook example of an insectile parasitoid here. And it even has a plenidial larva, which we'll get into later on. But, um, so many orders of insects have parasites in their ranks. It's a very efficient, if to us, rather callous and cruel um, way of life. You'll have some insects specified almost exclusively, like the wasps and the flies. So we'll get to a couple of them. But first, um, the new contestant tonight is the Congo floor maggot, or Keramaia senegalensis. You can probably tell from the last part where it comes from. <laughs> so this is one of the few insects that preferentially targets people. Um, if there aren't any people around, it will go for an aardvark or a hyena, but it definitely does prefer human blood. <laughs> so it's a species of blowfly. <laughs> it's a species of blowfly that lives in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in places where people uh, wear new shoes and have villages where they sleep on the floor directly, the earthen floor. That's part of its key strategy, because what it does is uh, the female, it's always the female that lays the eggs of course, she comes along when people are asleep on the floor of the hut, which is just earth, and she lays her maggots, or eggs I should say, in the floor next to the sleeping person. Um, the, the eggs hatch when they detect body heat, and the maggots go, oh hello, it's a human being, and they bore into, uh, usually they bore into the uh, bag or the feet, they don't do too much, they don't go right here, they just bore into the top layer of skin, take a blood meal, then go away and go back into the soil, do it again the next night and again the next night until they're ready to pupate, then they just stay in the soil and fly off when they're, when they're adults. Um, they don't, which, the good thing is they don't actually do much harm except give you a bit of uh, blood loss. They don't transmit diseases like some flies and mosquitoes can. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and also they're easily um, stopped, they're thwarted very easily, all you have to do is bite bed, because the maggots can't climb. <laughs> um, so if you stop sleeping on the floor, you'll stop the Congo floor maggot. However, they do have started to adapt to this, they realise that people start sleeping in beds, so now the females have also started laying eggs on clothing and washing lines. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you put the clothes on, the eggs take the heat of the body, they hatch, they take the blood meal, etc. Um, so um, people have now started uh, realising that to get rid of them that way, they just have to iron the clothes, and that kills the eggs. So it's an escalating war of attrition. I'm sure eventually they'll start laying eggs in breakfast cereal, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, so basically there's a standoff at the moment. But yeah, buy beds and iron, always iron your clothes and you'll be fine. Uh, our next little friend is the Zitsi fly. Not Setsi, not Tsitsi, it's a Zetsi. Um, I've seen a species. You may have known these ones, they're, they're uh, more or less in the public culture. Again, it's an African fly, uh, and it's a parasite of large mammals, including us, because we are, of course, large mammals. Uh, the female, again, lands on them and pierces them with us, or whatever it is, with the sharp mouth parts, takes a blood meal, and flies away. Uh, that's kind of similar to mosquitoes, which they're vaguely related to. Unlike mosquitoes, however, these have a remarkably mammalian uh, sort of parental care that they go into. Uh, the female doesn't lay dozens of eggs, she lays a single egg, which she retains inside her, in a structure that is basically a womb. Uh, it's the insect equivalent of a womb. Uh, the maggot grows inside of cycling uh, milky fluid, it's not milk, it's similar, uh, from what is basically a nipple uh, in the, in the uh, female's body. When it's ready to develop, it goes through all of its life cycles of all the um, developing stages inside the, the female's body. Then she gives birth to the maggot when it's just about to pupate and it immediately drops onto the ground and pupates and flies off as an adult. So yeah, it's very, it's uh, extremely unusual the level of parental care for an insect. Um, unfortunately for us, the bite of a zitsi fly is dangerous, not so much because of the fly itself, but because it transmits thousands of little um, single cell immune parasites called propanosomes. And um, they migrate into your lymphatic system, 
then into your, into your brain eventually. And they call something that's called trypanosomiasis, or you might refer to it as sleeping sickness. Uh, because of it, because if you to basically get a fever, then you go into a coma, and then you die. So, <laughs> needless to say, not very pleasant. Uh, there is an eradication program for the ones that do contribute to sleeping sickness. Not all of them have it, of course. Uh, but so far, it looks like the flies are more or less winning, because they can also attack cattle and give them a type of sleeping sickness that only affects cattle as well. Next up, water flies with the lovely Ibojomo name, yeah. um, These ones are found mostly in Europe and some in North America. Uh, they're basically found everywhere, except on Antarctica, which is a given. You know, nothing is found in Antarctica unless you're a seal or a penguin. Um, uh, so this one, again, is an obligate parasite of small mammals and large mammals, including us. Uh, the common name warble comes from two various points. Uh, firstly, females will fly over a large host, if it's a big one like us or an elk or something, and make a really weird buzzing noise, so you look up, which they call the warble. Then they bomb, <laughs> bomb your face and drop their larvae on you. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so she, she, uh, she tries to overpose it on the lips. Sometimes she misses and she hits other areas, which then they sometimes bounce off, if you're lucky. But if they succeed, then the larvae will burrow through your lips, go into your throat or your um, stomach and develop in there and then pass out either via cough or via other means if you're in your stomach. Uh, if, however, it's a species of warble that likes to develop in muscle tissue instead of inside you, then the warble refers to the fact that they lay their eggs on the legs of the host, uh, or wherever they can, the human, if the legs aren't covered. Uh, or I can't remember, should say, uh, the eggs will hatch and they'll form little blisters that are called wobbles. They look like boils, but they kind of move a bit. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, uh, so uh, meat and hide products that are from animals can be negatively affected uh, because, of course, they bore through the skin and it causes problems if you've got to hide. And the meat is affected because basically they eat it. <laughs> And they leave tunnels through the meat, uh, which are called the things called, which are filled with a thing called meat jelly, which is basically the insect's frass, which is poop, and uh, the regurgitated remains of the meat. So it kind of becomes unpalatable after that. Um, well, for most people anyway. Um, they don't really do much harm. Again, unless they parasitize the host in really large numbers, then they can get anemia. Um, and they don't transmit disease, which is good. Um, except, <laughs> and it's always an exception, uh, there's a rare condition that can come around in humans when the one that goes for your, wobbles over your head, if they miss the lips, they can hit your eyes and the larvae will bore into them, uh, and that can cause vision problems, of course. Uh, they can also um, miss the eye, or if they do miss the eyes uh, and don't blind or anything, they can bore through those into your brain. And then it's, it causes a um, condition called intracerebral myiasis, which causes the walls to form on your brain, which causes seizures, paralysis, coma, death, that kind of, all those pleasant kind of things. So if your flavors are moving, you should probably go to the doctor. <laughs> um, next one. This is an unusual picture. I mean, it gives away what it is, but it does not look at all like a fly. It's extremely uh, adapted for a parasitic lifestyle. Uh, it looks, many people, I've, I've seen some of them in the wild, and they look more like spiders coming at you from the fur of the back. Um, so, it's another fly that's evolved to become an ectoparasite. This one targets bats. Uh, you can actually, uh, people who study bats often look at the bat flies to identify the bats, because they have a, often one fly with popped out of one species of bat, and not just one species, also one part of the bat. So you can have like, four or five different species of fly, only on one bat, and only on like a wing, an ear, a nose, that kind of thing, and they don't come in more. Um, the hemovores is, of course, they take a blood meal. Uh, it doesn't hurt the bat unless there's a lot of them, and then they'll cause anemia. Um, so to have such an uh, um, active parasitic lifestyle, you can see it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't resemble a fly anymore. It's very flat, uh, you can't really see from there but they're um, dorsally flattened, eventually flattened, like a flea is. It makes it hard for the bat to pull them out. But they also have backwards pointing hairs. Again, that makes the uh, 
uh, bat very hard. It's, it, bats can't groom very well anyway, but it makes it very hard for the bat to get rid of them. Plus, the claws at the end are extremely strong, so they can hang on, especially when bats flying around, uh, so they won't fall and uh, dislodge. Um, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, they um, they can hang on to like grim death. If you're trying to get them off a bat, you'll probably end up breaking the fly before you um, remove it. So. Uh, yeah, unless you use pesticides, but that's harmful to the bat. So we basically just let them come off when they can, if you want to sample them. Uh, now we move on to another one you've probably heard of in pop culture, the bot fly. <laughs> there are several different types of bot flies, and I'm not going to cover them all because there's dozens and dozens of them. I'll just cover the, the roses ones. <laughs> okay, lucky. So here we have the camel bot fly, Cephalophino tibilator. They're found basically on 100% of wild camels, which is basically here, <laughs> where the wild match with the wild camel. Uh, there are two types again. Uh, it's a, this particular type of bot fly, the camel bot, is an intermediary host between the, the bots that go into your skin and develop there, and the bots that go into your stomach and develop there. These ones develop in the throat. So the females lay their eggs again around the lips or the nose, the larvae bore in, and sit there on the tongue and then the, the camel swallows them and it goes into the throat and they develop in the in the uh, pharynx and legs and that kind of area around there. Um, yeah, like I said, 100% of Australian camels are infected uh, because they're all wild. <laughs> uh, they can cause nutrition and breathing problems, but um, you know, there's, unless there's massive infestation, it won't do much harm. So if you eliminate feral camels in Australia, you might eliminate the camel bottle. You might, yes, you might. <laughs> uh, this next one is a native kangaroo box. You can tell from uh, probably from the scientific name where this one develops. <laughs> yes, um, it targets primarily grey kangaroos, but it will occasionally be suicidal and tackle the red kangaroo, which is big and nasty. Uh, occasionally it will also tackle wallabies. So again, they lay the eggs around the mouth, the maggots bore through the mouth, and they go into the upper throat or the lungs and develop. And when they finish developing, like the fourth or fifth instar, they'll, they'll irritate, move around, irritate the kangaroo or wallaby, and they'll cough and bring up the, the larvae and the pupae in the soil. So um, <laughs> it's basically, um, yeah, when they're about to pupate, they go deeper into the throat so they can be coughed up. So it's basically, you know, what's that skip? You've got something in your throat. Um, <laughs> next up, um, this is one of the largest insects in the world, with one flies, rhinoceros bots. They're, as well as being a parasite, they're, you can see probably from here, they mimic wasps so that they're not preyed on by their own predators. Uh, it's a particularly not type, uh, nasty type of spider wasp that they're mimicking. Um, this particular one, it's the second largest fly on Earth. They're, um, just check. Yep, uh, they routinely reach three inches in body length and a four inch wingspan. <laughs> because they're such a big insect, they have a big host. It's all the rhinoceros. Oh, rhinoceri. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the new African wasps will tear their own predators. Uh, the females, again, find, find a rhinoceros and they lay their eggs on the horn or the upper lip. Usually it's the horn. Uh, the the larvae migrate down into the nostrils or the mouth and uh, walk through, and uh, then it's swallowed. And they use hooks on the mouth parts to cling to the walls of the stomach inside of the rhinoceros. Occasionally, they take a blood meal, uh, getting bigger and bigger and developing. And then, when they're ready to pupate, they just let go and they pass out of the rhinoceros droppings and pupate in the droppings. Some of them pupate under the droppings so that they don't get eaten by dung beetles. Uh, lots of them just uh, I've learned just to do that, but most of them will pupate in the dung and they fly off. Unfortunately, uh, with the fairly recent human uh, hunting of rhinoceros, dropping the numbers way down, this shallow has also become extremely rare now uh, because the rarer the host is, the rarer the parasite. So you don't see very many of them anymore, only every now and then. And of course, when we get a uh, um, rhinoceros in the wild, the first thing they do is uh, get rid of the parasites and bye bye to the rhinoceros bot fly. They're, now, they're listed as endangered, but that might go up to critically endangered before too long. Hopefully not. Now, you knew this one was coming. <laughs> Human bots. 
another one of the parasites is specific, uh, is specific to human beings. Um, probably came to us via some other ape, like a gorilla or a chimpanzee, but now it prefers humans, because it knows how easy we are <laughs> to take it on. Um, so, um, what was it? Yeah. Fortunately for the general populace, but unfortunately for entomologists, uh, the bot fly is not one of these species that demands to be swallowed. Uh, it prefers to stay in the skin. So in the areas where it's found, uh, mostly Central and South America, um, the females lay eggs on the skin, again on the clothes. Uh, they feel the, uh, oh, I'm on, a, I'm on a host. They hatch, bore into the, uh, the top layer of skin, and then have a party, mill around, cause localized pain, swelling, bleeding. Uh, again, unless you've got dozens, you're not going to be in uh, much trouble, but it will hurt because they're actively boring through you. Uh, so most people go to the doctor and get them removed. I guess. Sorry, what is is What is bot fly? Bot is, uh, is, it basically means a, a, it's like a, a, a lump. Oh. So um, all the bot flies make lumps in wherever they're targeting and whatever species they're targeting. So this one, yeah, it makes some, you can't really see it here because it's been excised, but that, that there, it's like, it looks like a boil, except when you touch it, it, it wiggles. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah uh, they've um, started uh, taking a cue from the uh, Congo floor maggot and they take sleeping humans because they're less easy to uh, whack them. Uh, also, uh, they cut out the middleman, or they use a middleman, I should say, sometimes by grabbing mosquitoes. Laying, uh, forcibly laying their eggs on the mosquito's abdomen, then letting them go, so the mosquito will deliver their eggs to the host next time it visits a human being. But that way they don't have to get swatted or worry about being swatted at all. Um, either way, um, yeah, usually um, the fly will go unnoticed um, because if it, well, if it is noticed, it's going to be more than one, so you'll feel pain all go around. Usually there's only one or two, they're in the scalp, and you just Oh, that's itchy. I wonder mean, what do that is, and you just forget about it until <laughs> you come in your head. Out comes the butt fly, or out comes the adult um, fly. The cycle starts again. Usually, people will notice um, if they're um, having some sort of irritation, and they'll go to the doctor, and then they'll say, "Look, this boil here. Ooh, what's that?" And they'll extract it. If you're really unlucky uh, and it's in a nasty position, like on the in the thigh, or in the stomach, or on the stomach, I should say, or somewhere inaccessible, you'll need it removed surgically, but it's just a local operation. Usually the doctor will cover um, cover the maggot, uh, the breathing parts, which are, um, I can't see on this one, but uh, yeah, it's, it breathes from the, from the trachea, which is usually around there. I think this one's upside down, yeah. And um, so they cover it with petroleum jelly, it can't breathe, so it surfaces, and they can grab it with tweezers and pull it out. Um, so yeah, it's not, not too bad. Um, uh, if you're unaware or unwilling to have it removed, because you might think it's cute or a conversation piece or something, um, they will, it, it will eventually emerge on its own in six weeks and no ill effects really. They're going to transmit disease, which is good. And they do produce quite strong antibiotics and they're really yes. infected. Yes. Um, they don't want that host to get ill. So they're producing strong antibiotics yeah. to protect the host while they're feeding them on the host. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, parasites don't want you to die because then they'll die with you. Um, next up, one that's not so nice, the black fly, Parasomodium. Now these ones are mostly in the Arctic or around the Arctic, Canada, Alaska, that kind of thing. Um, this one uh, is another swarm of species of insect. It creates chaos and panic in huge and large numbers, much like locusts or antimaxes. Um, uh, so we've got the black fly here. They're very, they're very closely related to mosquitoes, but they're not mosquitoes. Um, they're in the same infra order, which is cool as some old today. So um, despite very different appearances, you can see that uh, this thing here on the prothor is also they're called pump flies, or buffalo gnats. Um, they are very similar to mosquitoes, but not mosquitoes, but they have a similar life cycle. They're blood drinkers, um, they live in marshlands, and uh, they often encounter human beings when human beings are camping, fishing, recreating in lakes and things. There are other, apart from human beings, they're also like caribou, but when they're attacking human beings, they occur in astronomically large numbers, and I mean astronomically large numbers, to the point where the danger to humans isn't so much being 
having a blood drug is asphyxiation by inhaling too many. You can see that person has colored in black fly. Uh, he's having respiratory problems because of so many. There are literally millions in a swarm and there are thousands of swarms. So we're talking locust numbers. What we call black fly? Yeah, uh, in close up, they're kind of black. They're more blackish than a mosquito, so they, they just call them black fly. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're definitely more black than anything else. Uh, so yeah, that's where, that's stuff. But buffalo now is another name for them. Um, Are they similar to the um, the flies that are on the most coast of Scotland? They're related to that, those kind of midges, but they're not they're not actually a midge. They're in their own family. But they're, they're in that basic family. Yeah. Um, so the primary difference is the swarming. That's um, from most other things that are not that big. I mean, they'll get together in groups, but not that big. So um, uh, the mosquitoes might congregate in a couple of hundred uh, if they find a particularly juicy person or you know, a light source or something. These will congregate in the millions and uh, cause problems like, you know, like asphyxiation in human beings. When they're not actively causing human beings having respiratory problems, they're tormenting uh, caribou uh, to the point that uh, Radio, as, as you might want to call them. Um, they bite so much uh, with the caribou that they can actually drive the caribou crazy. Um, they will actively stampede if they, feel, if they hear one coming, just one. Uh, and um, calves and smaller caribou can be accelerated completely by a big enough swarm. So it will kill them. <laughs> um, so in Africa and America, the target the flies is target human irritation, uh, human fishermen, I should say just causing irritation. In Alaska, you know, they can cause yeah, exoneration of the cat, uh, caribou. But, surprise, they have a nasty surprise for us as well. This little fella here is an onchocerid worm parasite. He's coming out of the antenna of that black fly. Now, um, in Africa and Latin America, um, not everywhere, but mostly in those places where the black flies come from, um, yeah, yeah, they're going to the corner. The um, the long coloriasis parasite, parasite there uh, goes into the eye of a human being, burrows into it, and it causes something called African river blindness. It um, migrates around the eye until it's destroyed the vision in the eye. Well, it's, it's, it's basically it's going, where the hell am I? I'm lost. So it's looking all over the place for its proper pa proper host, and whilst it's doing that, it's destroying the vision in the eye of the person. Um, so the black fly, however, is not entirely disastrous. In the early 90s, there's a semi-famous case of homicide in rural Virginia, where um, a woman was found drowned in a car in a river, and her husband was like, oh yeah, he, she went off in an argument. We, we, you know, we were having an argument. She went off, drove off in the car, and she must have gone over, the car, over a bridge or something into the river. The, the forensic animals on the scene, they had thousands of black fly cocoons all over the car. Uh, this was um, in um, autumn, and uh, black fly don't pupate in autumn, they pupate in the warmer months. So they knew that Harry could have been there, uh, you know, being moved there from somewhere else. He eventually admitted he strangled and put her in the car and dumped it in the river. So they basically said, uh, these little fellows basically helped solve the murder. <laughs> So they're not all bad, just the most of them, like 90%. <laughs> now we come to another nasty one. Uh, this is the one that uh, even I kind of hesitate to kind of like. Screw worms. Um, again, guess what they eat? <laughs> <laughs> not exclusively, I'll grant you. Um, so again, it's this, the screw worm, there's two types, there's the old world and the new world. Both of them, um, a, uh, um, a type of blowfly, and extremely unusually for a blowfly, almost all of which, except for the screw worms, eat dead tissue. So if you've got a wound, like Dan said, they can actually be beneficial if they're in the wound because they'll keep, uh, use their antibiotic saliva, keep the wound open, but also keep it sterile. These ones go for living tissue, not dead. Um, so you can probably reason why it's uh, not very pleasant. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they, um, um, yeah, they found originally in Central America, but they basically spread worldwide very quickly uh, due to, um, you know, cargo ships, planes, smuggling, all that kind of thing, just not noticed. Uh, female flies are predators of any, any animal with an open wound. Uh, males are the 
females of all the flies and mosquitoes just eat pollen, the family homes, it's the females you have to worry about. So when they come across a wild or domestic animal that has a wound or a weeping orifice of some sort, it doesn't have to be a wound, it can be a, a, a lamb after having birth, the, the birth fluids, it can be a runny nose, anything that will attract into an orifice. They'll um, attack it immediately, uh, lay their eggs around the wound or the orifice, and um, it's called fly strike in um, people who raise sheep. That's why um, they take the tails and the stuff the tails off sometimes so they can minimize the damage that the uh, schoolworm will do. So um, here we go, an animal. Yeah, that's the maggot. You can see these nice little uh, mandible structures here, which are very sharp. <laughs> Yes, again, uh, with the back of pointing spires, it makes them very hard to pull out because it'll hurt. Um, so, yeah, they'll feed uh, on the flesh and the blood that they tunnel into. They'll keep tunneling, they won't stop. Uh, they're called screw worms because it goes in a corkscrew shape. Uh, they start off here, down, 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 doing lots of pain and damage on the way. Um, there's almost always will result in the death of the host by tissue loss or shock. Uh, because it, there's a lot of them and it hurts like hell. Um, so it causes chaos in um, domestic animals like sheep, cows, things like that. And it has killed some people as well. Um, it uh, has led to environmental chaos in wild animals, like protected or endangered animals that have been targeted. And uh, it economic disasters in the farm animals. Um, it also does um, attack human beings every now and then. Uh, myiasis is the entomological term for infestation of maggots in living human tissue. Uh, it's usually in humans associated with abuse or neglect cases. Not so much in school worms. If they see anyone who's helpless, hello, I'm your new friend. Uh, so, uh, I have, uh, this is all right, no, I didn't use those. I took those particular ones out because they were a bit too gross. Uh, for the younger people in the US, there were a few uh, photos of human myiasis, but it's readily available on the internet if you want to lose your lunch. <laughs> Fortunately, however, in 1958, um, they were basically uh, given the marching orders by two American scientists, two American entomologists, Dr. Edward Nickling and Raymond C. Bushland of the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, they proposed a solution uh, which uses another quirk of the five biology against it. Females uh, will only mate once. And um, it doesn't matter if it, it, result, it will almost always result in fertilization, not always, but they'll only ever make the one time. That's it. Um, so, what they did was they got a whole, they bred a whole bunch of screwworms in the lab, male screwworm flies, sterilized them with radiation, and released them in huge numbers. So, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So, there were more sterile lab screwworm males than there were wild ones. So they mated with the females, no progeny because they're sterile. The females are like, well, I'm done. And within one or two generations, screwworm numbers just went crashing down to the point where there were basically no longer problems. Um, every now and then, uh, there will be another screwworm breakout in Central America, Africa, Asia, here occasionally. Uh, but it's it, because they're in much smaller numbers, they're around about 5 to 10% of what they used to be. You can just take them out locally uh, with insecticides or things like that, and it won't do anywhere near as much damage as, um, as it used to. Uh, that's why people still dock the tails, like I said, lambs and things like that. Uh, just to make sure that if there are any screwworms around, then they don't, don't, won't be able to get a foothold. So, um, like I said, they'll never approach the levels they were pre-1958, but they are still here, they're not extinct. Okay, the next one. Another cool one. The egg to capture in foreign. <laughs> That's this little fellow up here. <laughs> so this is a um, tiny little uh, dipterin known as a scuttlefly because for some strange reason they, they have wings, they can fly as you can see, they don't like to, they prefer to run around. They'll land and they'll run around all over the place rather than use their wings. They will fly if they're in an emergency situation like they're about to be eaten by something. That's basically the only time they'll fly, usually they'll walk. Um, so yeah, they're also called scuttleflies. Um, yeah, so they have a wide array of habitats and lifestyles, but several of them have to have a parasitism, like this little fella. Um, so this one is from South America. 
installs the leaf cutter ant. Uh, this is a worker on the leaf cutter ant. You might have seen them. Oh, well, yeah, that's right, that's the fire ant. They also stalk fire ants. But yeah, leaf cutter ants and, and uh, army ants are um, their primary hosts. Uh, yeah. So, Atta is the one, yeah, the leaf cutter ant. They look for a stragglers uh, when you'll see. Hang on, see the one? Yes, that's a leaf cutter. See, it's landed on the leaf there and it's waiting to see if anyone comes to her rescue and then she'll strike her. Um, <laughs> what they do, and it sounds like it's only in a horror movie, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> they sit on the leaf, wait for, make sure that they're in the clear, there's no one going to come and interrupt them. Then they'll dive bomb the, the ants. They usually go for the large worker ants or the, or the large soldier ants, the bigger ones, they're a whole cast in a system. They don't go for the small ants, they go for the large ones. Uh, so they'll dive bomb the, the, um, the uh, ant and inject eggs with, into the ant's abdomen with their ovipositum. The maggots hatch inside the body and migrate through the body up into the head of the ant where they, where they sit and just chill for a while, eating the brain basically. The ant doesn't die, it just keeps wandering around in a kind of puzzled state, I suppose. Maybe it's on the fire. You know, um, and it, just, it keeps doing its thing, but it's kind of slower and kind of a, what? <laughs> uh, eventually, the, um, uh, the maggot uh, completes its development, at which point it severs the head completely from the neck of the ant uh, and pupates inside the head capsule and emerges as the adult fly from the head of the ant. Uh, this is a horror movie waiting to happen. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, uh, as they're small, like I said, um, it takes a while for them to kill the host, so the, the ant is basically wandering around like in a perpetual zombie state until it gets its head ripped off. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, leaf cutter ants have become aware of the danger and um, they've got a defense strategy now, the, the, only the big ones are targeted, so they're taken to carry little guard ants on the top of the leaf and um, so if a, if a senior actor finally comes along and says, oh, you've got a guard, goes away and just bothers somebody else uh, because otherwise the little guard ones will squirt formic acid at them until they leave them alone. <laughs> they have actually been used as biological control. Um, the US Department of Agriculture uh, has imported them to deal with fire ants. I'm not sure if you've heard of fire ants. They're an extremely invasive, extremely aggressive uh, feral and nuisance. There's also on Christmas Island, uh, de destroying some of the crabs in there. Um, the uh, foreign fly tends, seems to actually like them better than the leaf cutters. So uh, they've imported a whole bunch of them from Central America into Florida and uh, uh, Arkansas, you know, wherever they, um, they find the fire ants. And they go to town on the fire ants. And so you eventually have all these decapitated fire ants lying everywhere. And the, the flies are very happy, and the people are very happy, but the fire ants aren't so happy. Basically, they don't have guards, so the, 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 um, the little foreign flies are like, ooh, free buffet. Yeah. Next up, we have the sheep kick. Again, it's an extremely highly modified fly. Um, you can probably see in front of there what it eats. <laughs> um, again, it's, it's a fly that doesn't look like a fly. They're related to bat flies, uh, and they have a similar bizarre appearance because they live in the wall of the sheep. Uh, so they're flattened. You can see again, it's very flat. Uh, no wings because wings would get in the way. Uh, so they chew them off if they're bored with them at all. Uh, they're eyeless because they're just wandering around in the sheep's wool. They don't really need eyes. Uh, and again, they've got very strong claws and backwards pointing hairs so that the sheep, if they were able to, uh, can't pull them out and groom them out. Uh, unfortunately, they don't really uh, do that much damage unless there's, there's a life cycle. You've got the, the female, the male, I should say, the female, and then they capture. They don't do very much damage to a sheep unless there's a lot of them, and then it's just taking blood meal every now and then. They seem, strangely enough, not to like body heat, which is opposite of most flies that take this kind of thing. They won't go near the skin, they'll stay in the wall. If they put near the skin, they'll migrate away again. Uh, it seems to freak them out. <laughs> I don't know why. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of them in the wall. Uh, they will not go further than the wall. So they're easily enough to get rid of if you shear a sheep. 
they'll probably take they'll probably take the kids out. Not that they've been severe harm with the sheep anyway. Yeah, um, me, uh, yeah. You said that that's an egg capsule, or does it contain a number of eggs or Yeah, yeah, yes yeah, it does. Um, they don't do too much harm unless it's a lot. Like I said. Which is that easy? You said that they take a blood meal, so does that mean that they crawl down through the wall? Yeah, they, they, crawl, down to, just run yeah, they crawl down to the skin, take a blood meal, and they're like, yeah, this is too warm, and they go back up again to the top part of the, yeah, the, the wall. They really don't like the warmth of the body for some reason. Um, now we move on to fleas. This is a flea, again, it's, uh, I, I'm sure you all know what a flea is, but you know it's cats. Uh, and those who don't. <laughs> but uh, this is a unique one. Instead of being an external parasite, an ectoparasite, it's an endoparasite that's inside you. <laughs> and again, it's another one of those uh, few animals that targets, targets people on purpose. Um, so it's the smallest flea known to science, it's only about a millimeter long. Um, it's found in Central and South America, surprise. <laughs> and uh, it recently, fairly recently, it's found its way over in Africa as well. Um, they live in the sand, they hang around um, just under the surface of the sand until they sense the approach of a human being walking along. Um, then, uh, of course you have to be barefoot, they'll um, wait for the human to pass over and walk straight into the foot. Um, so you can have about between 5 or 10, even more if you're unlucky. Um, if the jig is male, it will hop up on the host, take a blood meal, say thanks for the blood, and leave. If it's female, it will bore into the foot, um, and then expand itself about a hundred times, like a chick does. It starts off tiny, ends up the size of a pea, swarm the blood and eggs, and, uh, and basically it sticks the spiracles of its posterior out so the males can mate with it, uh, whilst it doesn't have to move. And every now and then it will shed eggs into the, out, of the, out of the foot into the surrounding ecosystem. Um, it doesn't cause any major diseases, and it is easily stopped by wearing shoes. So, wear shoes, keep fleas away. <laughs> um, yeah, it basically just causes pain and itching, although it can cripple you if there's dozens of them. Um, uh, doctors will just remove them with a scalpel and a little anesthetic. Yeah, but wear shoes. <laughs> From one that's fairly harmless, fairly harmless, to one that is definitely not harmless, in fact, that has changed human history, on into rat fleas and oxalatiopsis. The primary vector for the bubonic plague. So, um, yeah, this insect actually, if somewhat inadvertently, changed the course of humanity. Uh, is, this name is now kind of frowned on, um, kind of like it's a bit archaic because they're not only found in the area, they're found everywhere. They're now called mostly tropical rat fleas to be you know, less kind of on the nose. Uh, but the oriental rat fleas still used in some places. Um, basically, they're found anywhere in the world, which is tropical, anywhere where there are mammals. They're found in America, they're found in, in Europe, they're found in Australia. Um, anywhere where we are, or anywhere where its primary host animal, the black and the brown rat, is found, you'll find that. Um, so the insect itself is not particularly stand out for a flea. Uh, it doesn't have pronotal or medial combs on the head, or behind, well, you can't really see them in this photo, well, you wouldn't see them, it doesn't happen. But basically, behind the jaw and behind the neck, the combs that are in most fleas, these ones don't have them. Um, it makes it more distinct from other fleas. It uh, goes com undergoes complete metamorphosis when it's a uh, little, little larvae, it doesn't look like a flea, it looks more like a silverfish thing. Um, and then eventually becomes a wingless, flattened animal that most people are familiar with. Um, yeah, they attack humans and other things because they're attracted to carbon monoxide that they breathe out, like a mosquito is. Um, but the problem with the, this little fellow is not so much the flea, but what the flea's got in its gut. Yeah. Yes. That's a memento mori in Europe um, for the victims of the plague death. Um, so the, the bacteria, it's a bacteria called Yersinia pestis that lives in the gut of the flea. Eventually it will kill the flea by the starvation because it blocks the flea's gut so that it can't take enough blood in to get, um, get uh, nutrition. Unfortunately that also makes them extremely hungry, so they bite more. Um, so the bacteria lives in the stomach and blocks the digestion, like I said. Um, the rat, well, the, the, uh, when it's in a rat, 
the rat can survive with the um, bubonic plate much better than we can because of the composition of their blood. So it can go a lot longer than the human can when they're infected. Human beings, however, if they come into contact with the flea, which is on the rat, um, will develop a black death, which is, you know, I'm sure you all have heard of the black death of bubonic plate. Massive swelling in the lymph nodes, fever, basically system-wide organ failure, COVID and death. Uh, and it's highly contagious, which is not very helpful. Uh, and it caused massive um, devastation across most of the known world, three times in the Middle Ages, mostly in the, in the 14th century uh, and also in the 15th century, killing approximately 50 million people, um, including around 60% of the population of Europe at that time. So, uh, yeah. Uh, not very nice. Uh, so, nor is it only found in the Middle Ages. Lots of people don't realize that it still happens now, as in today. Uh, about 1,000 people to 2,000 people still die of bubonic plague a year, mostly in Asia and Africa. Every now and then, still about 5 to 10 people die in America, uh, in Yellowstone National Park and other national parks where they pick up a chipmunk or a, a, you know, a, mo a, mo a, a chipmunk or a prairie dog, some sort of rodent. They all have these fleas that are, and they all have vectors of plague in them, so they'll get the flea on it and get, get the bubonic plague. So, um, yeah, not so good. Uh, yeah. In addition to uh, England that are killing a large percentage of the world's population, uh, it also transmits typhus as well as bubonic plague, so that's another disease it's got, and uh, two types of tapeworm that are normally found in rats but will happily adapt to human beings if they, uh, <laughs> if they want to. So not a particularly nice animal, that one. Now we move on to another you know, type of insect that has a particular facility for parasitism, I should say wasps. We have the emerald cockroach cock cock wasp, the ampullate compressor. This is a particularly pretty wasp, you can't really see it there, they have all sorts of iridescent, like greenish blue colours. Um, I mentioned Andy in an alien before, with you his marvellously creepy little parasitoid. This is one of the three insects that they're based on. Um, the other one would be a termite and another type of parasitic wasp. Uh, yeah, so the, the one that runs around the outer space, lumping on people's faces and ripping out of their chests, is largely based on Angela's compressor here. Um, it's certainly having a switch for a flamethrower if it was just a little bit bigger than about an inch. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a small um, parasite, parasite found in um, Southeast Asia. It preys exclusively on cockroaches. It doesn't go for the smaller, uh, wingless ones. It usually goes for the big American or Australian or German cockroaches, the big orange ones that fly in your face and ski in the summer nights. Um, she's not actually hunting them for herself, she's hunting them for her offspring. So um, when she finds a cockroach, she'll sting it twice. The first one is just like a, a general sting in the, in the legs to stop it from running away. The second goes into the brain and makes it act very strange. It, um, you know, it, the first one just makes it sure that it can't run away. The second one uh, goes into his brain and stops its, um, stops its fleeing and escaping response and stops it reacting properly to danger. So it just kind of sits there and says, oh yeah, yeah, it was, hi. And um, then what she does is she's, she's as you can see, she's, she's rather a lot smaller than the wasp is. She can't drag it on her own back to her own, back to her nest. She help, she gets the, the cockroach to help her kill it. <laughs> what she does is she, well, you can see there she's grabbing it by the head. She'll cut off most of its antenna, just leaving a few bits of stubs which will suck the fluid out just for a snack. As, just to make it more nightmarish. Um, yeah, then she'll pull uh, on the, using the remains of the antenna as like reins on a cow, or a horse, and uh, she'll guide it back to her nest whilst it's, it's walking forward going, oh yeah, we're going somewhere. Um, she'll guide it to the nest, pull, pull it down into the nest, and then she'll sting it again so it won't ever move again. But it's alive. Um, not healthy, but it's alive. Um, she, she'll then um, seal, she'll then lay a single egg on the outside of the cockroach, uh, seal the burrow and leave, and then a couple of, about a week or two later, the grubs will hatch, bore into the cockroach, and eat it from the inside out. Um, and then once they're, um, they'll keep the vital organs till the last, so that they'll keep the insect alive for as long as they can, nice and fresh and juicy. Then when they're just about to pupate, they'll eat the rest of the organs and the, basically the cockroach at that point is a puppet, a shell, 
Then the boots out as Adam was saying, hello, we're going to do this all over again. So, <laughs> yeah, they um, quite don't know where she threw a cockroach, but it turned out to know where she threw a human being. That's why they give the first thing, which is to know that they the legs. leg. Sometimes it doesn't work and the and the cockroach will do it. <laughs> yeah, because they're only tiny and pop them along like a football. Next up we have possibly the bravest parasite that I know. That, that one, this is what he eats, or she eats. Most of you probably know what an ant larvae is. Uh, the little conical pits that have the little, this little fellow at the bottom. Ants fall down, and get sucked dry, and the ant lion grows into it. Basically, it looks like a lace wing and flies off and goes, Hello, I'm pretty, but look at my children. Um, this, this particular one is a very vicious, venomous to other insects, not to us, uh, predator of ants and not any, anything else that goes into its uh, pit. This likes to attack them. <laughs> ant lion chelsea wasp. It's tiny, it's only about a millimeter long. Um, ant lion is themselves not that big. <laughs> yeah. So it, it locates an ant in my, my picture, no hard task because they're everywhere. Uh, she'll go in, down into the pit, deliberately allow herself to fall in, uh, when the, and then she'll, she always backs in as well. She, you'll notice that is, that's the abdomen there, that's a leg. The top part of the leg is swollen and very heavily fortified. She'll wrangle the legs at the ant lion, the ant lion will grab the legs and try and suck it dry. Before it can do that, she stings it on the face. And paralyzes it and lays her eggs on. <laughs> so um, yeah. Is it just swollen on one leg or both of them? It's swollen on both. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, she basically while the airline is busy trying to gnaw through her legs, she's got the sting in the middle and she just goes, aha! And, and she's holding it, holding it. Yeah, she's holding the jaws apart, apart you know, to try and uh, so that he, he but even if he did get it or the thing did get it to they're so um so heavily armored it probably wouldn't do much damage. Next up, we have another. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes. So, is it like. So, she's like frying its jaws. Yeah, she's frying its jaws. Stabbed it through the mouth yeah. whilst it's trying to eat it. Whilst it's trying to eat it, yeah. <laughs> They're very brave or very stupid, the boys. <laughs> uh, but uh, they have my respect. We have another home doctor now, an ant. Parasitic favorite ant. Now, this one is very strange. It's a very little known species of ant that's uh, just described by known ecologists as the ultimate parasite, uh, particularly in Switzerland and the French Alps is where they're from. This particular one is unusual. It's, it lacks any workers. It's only found as a queen. This is a queen. Um, you can also see that um, well, it does produce the occasional male for mating purposes, but there's no workers at all. Um, so it also is like it's in a parasite. You can see it's very um, unusually flattened, especially around the abdomen here. It's kind of concave. Uh, it doesn't really have very good mouth parts. It can't digest things really well. Um, it certainly can't forage on its own like an inland can. Here we have the parasitic pavement ant attached to the host queen. That's what they do. They rush in to their, um, the, when, sometimes they're like inside the actual nest, sometimes they're not. They'll rush into the nest, find the queen, that's, that's the parasite that's the host, they'll find the queen and jump on. Uh, sometimes, it, lots of them, up to about five or ten, um, usually it's only one or two, they'll jump on her and hug her really tightly and just grip on until the, they get the quality scent on them. And uh, then the, any soldier ants or other ants that come along go, let's see, oh no, you're just the queen, it's alright, you're right, you carry on. You know. <laughs> so the, 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 well, they'll eventually start smelling like, they'll very quickly start smelling like the queen so they won't be bothered. Um, Please? You showed us the other one with the bushes, so it's with the pupa. Yeah. This is a different one, isn't it? This one is it's a, it's a healthy one. That one is a museum specimen. Uh, so yeah, that one's in a bottle of alcohol. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that one's an alive, living, healthy one. So it's, you can't really see that it's got the same thing. There's very small mouth parts, very small antennae. Uh, the abdomen isn't as uh, isn't as isn't it as as yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, the claws are as a lot of parasites. The claws are very long, and powerful. They grip very quickly, and you can't pull them off. The host queen without hurting them. Um, I was just wondering, if the like, ants would it hurt the queen? 
like if when they attack the queen to like get the scent of them, does it hurt them? They don't actually do any harm, uh, which is probably why they're so successful. So um, what do they attack if they don't attack the queen? Well, they, they attack in the sense that they jump on them and one way go. <laughs> But uh, they don't actually do anything. I mean, if it's five or ten, they might stop having mobility issues. You know, she might use have to drag herself around. But Queen has tends to not use that much anyway. So, um, also, then that pretty much just means that they've granted themselves permission of the whole kingdom. Yeah, basically. And they're just like, I am the new Queen. Yeah. <laughs> and now, a lot of the times, well, all the times I should say, once they're sufficiently established, They'll start laying eggs, uh, and they'll mix with the eggs of the, the host queen. The um, host workers and nurses will treat them as the, queen, the proper queen's eggs, and groom them and nurse them. Then they'll go, hello, we're parasites, but you don't know that, so we're valid. Either stay in the colony and um, wait for new queens to develop, and then leave with them, or they'll just leave on their own and uh, hopefully find nearby nests. But yeah, as a parasite, they don't do that much damage. It's basically just, you know, I'm going to steal all your resources, <laughs> rather than I'm going to kill you. So, yeah, they're not, uh, uh, as a parasite, they're not going to, the, uh, you know, they're not going to uh, rip their faces off or, you know, in, in, you know uh, pup pupate in their lungs or anything like that. So they're, they're fairly, um, fairly benign for parasite. Uh, now we move on to another one that you might be aware of. It's two bug. I'm into the two bugs now. <laughs> um, yeah, there are two species of bed bug. One basically is small and round than the other one, that's, and one, the one that's not as small and round also attacks bats as well as humans. The little, round, the little one like this only, is human, only goes for people. Um, so they hide in the daytime, during, uh, you know, in cracks in walls or on the floor, somewhere you can't see them. Come out at night when the human host is sleeping and take a blood meal, which a lot of parasites do, but they like the blood. Um, dozens or do and dozens of individual bed bugs can attack the same host at the same time, uh, which is very, makes you very itchy. You have, you have lots of uh, itchy welts all over you from after a you know, night of bed bug infestation. Uh, in Western Australia, we do have them, but they tend to be confined mostly to backpacker hostels for some reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the eastern states, they're starting to become a problem. Uh, in America, they're everywhere. Um, if you go to a hotel in the United States, bring some spray. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, maybe avoid backpacker hostels in the near future in Western Australia. Um, I'm sure the tourism department won't like that. Uh, so two interesting facts about bed bugs. Females don't have genitals, or genital opening, I should say, they have genitals. They don't have an external genital opening. Um, so the males uh, practice something that's called traumatic insemination. Yes, uh, another photo we had to delete. <laughs> uh, males, the, the penis of the male, which is unusual in the first place that they have one, a lot of insects don't, uh, is very big, very sharp, and very uh, like a club. Um, basically, traumatic insemination, the female doesn't have an uh, external genital opening, the male makes one by basically hammering with, uh, with his penis like a banana man until he cracks the female's uh, integument and then he just dumps sperm into the abdomen willy-nilly and eventually some of them will get into the, the um, internal genitals and um, into the pool and she'll get pregnant. The, the female is specially reinforced so that she doesn't die when he um, rams his penis into her repeatedly and they're easily sexed because uh, if it's provided they've made it. You can tell which ones are virgin females and which aren't because virgin females are pristine. Uh, females that have made it have covered in scars all over their own um, from their mouth penis. Another interesting fact, bird bugs in the lab are notoriously difficult to breed because males uh, have an extremely high propensity for homosexuality. Um, to the point where in the lab, uh, male bed bugs will develop the same hardened exoskeleton that the females have because they're so used to getting violated by the males that they, they, grow, they grow that so they won't kill them. So yeah, um, no external genitals, lots of gay bed bugs. <laughs> now we have one that's, well this one's not exactly pleasant, this one 
but um, they don't do any serious harm. We had my delivery ways later to do it. Um, so again, basically, um, no real damage is done except for long term amounts of crime. So you know, it's um, no worse than an Adam Sandler movie, really. Um, next up, uh, we're coming to the conclusion. But next up, Beatles. Here we have the Beatles. Beatles. Again, you'll see a, a common one, a common amongst blood drinkers that live in fur, extremely flat, um, reduced or absent eyes, and, well, you can't see the claws from here, bloody big claws that hang on. <laughs> um, beaver beetles. So this is another set of parasites that lives on the body of beavers in uh, America and Canada. I live the fur where it feeds on skin, skin secretion, dandruff, and mostly blood. Uh, it's also found inside the dam of the beaver. Um, where it will occasionally pop off and attack any other parasites that are like fleas and things like that, and them as well. Basically, it's getting the second hand blood in that case. Um, so, um, like I said, it's lost its eyes, it's lost um, wings, it doesn't have any wings anymore. Uh, it's very flat and it's got back its pointy hair, so the beaver, when it's trying to get rid of the curve, they do. Um, it's also um, got very powerful hooks, not just on the, on the um, on the uh, legs, it's also got a hook on its abdomen and a hook on its thorax underneath, so that when the beaver goes into the water, they hang on like good jet. Um, I assume they come up the breath long enough, but they don't, like, they don't get uh, swept away. Now we have another one, the oil beetle. Now this one's quite interesting. Uh, this is an insect that's parasitic only as a larva, but not as an animal. Um, they're called, that's called a, pro uh, sorry, a new protolinic parasite. Uh, one of the best examples is, is the oil beetle. So as adults, they basically either they don't feed at all, or they feed on pollen, nectar, that kind of stuff. Um, as larvae, however, they form something called a triangle. Now, this is not an individual animal. This is all the larvae from a particular hatching. They bundle together in this form and sit on a flower or leaf stem or whatever and wait for their host, usually a bee, sometimes a wasp. And then when I'll show you an individual. Yeah. So yeah, you can see the kind of uh, four legs. When a bee or a wasp comes on, they all jump on it en masse. Um, they're not actually trying to kill it or hurt it, they just want to use it as a taxi. Um, so they'll all jump on it, climb on, and then the bee will take it back to its nest. It's usually a solitary bee, not a wood, like a, uh, not a honey bee. And then they'll drop off and move to the larvae of the bee. Um, sometimes they will just sit on the outside of the bee and take the occasional blood meal. These particular ones, the red stripe will be on here, which are uh, bumblebees, and this one, the wasp mimic, which take the time as wasps. Uh, they take it a little further, um, and then they, um, yeah, as wasps form a triangle and going back to the nest, they don't just stay on the outside of the host, but bore into the larvae of the bee or the wasp. And eat them from the inside out and then pop out as larvae as the adults like the um, jewel wasp did, the uh, campus compressor. So, um, yeah. Not very nice for those two. Most of the time they're okay unless, you know, the real dawn uses a winged taxi service. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, a lot of the time with these particular two, the that one. Excuse me, that, yes. uh, that photo there, does it? Yeah, it looks like a frog. So do the uh, wings fold back in under the... This one? Yeah. Yeah, the, it's, the, uh, yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. Like, like all of the beetles, they fold them under the, the yeah. lantern at the back. Yeah. Uh, they, it pulls them out when it wants to be... Hi, I'm a wasp. Hi, I'm a wasp, nothing to see here. And then when it's not mimicking a wasp, it's on its own, folds them back again. I'm sure that's the case because there are some beetles with very small micro. Yeah. And I think this one just has much reduced like a tiny actually folds through that. It tends to be because it's trying to be pretending it's a wasp. So yeah, even the ones, if, if it doesn't uh, actually bore into them, um, sometimes that can kill the larvae because they just, it takes so much energy out of them, they don't have any more energy to pupate, so they just die as larvae. That's the host of the thing. Okay, now we have the... Oops, no, wait. Uh, I'll skip that one. Now we have one that's, again, a mild process this morning. <laughs> we discussed uh, meiosis, the process by which flies lay eggs on living human tissue. Um, this
things out there. It's a rare up, but related phenomenon involving beetles and uh, uh, yeah, it's called cantharitis in, uh, in, in so beetles that go on the human body. Um, uh, they're called it's, uh, a scarab, usually a scarab. If it's another type of beetle, it's a different thing, which we'll get to. If it involves beetle larvae, it's, a, it's called cantharitis. If it involves an adult beetle, it's carabiasis. It's basically the beetle growing places in a human that they're really not meant to be going. Um, so it's, it's extremely rare uh, in this day and age where food production is much more regimented and uh, you know, flowers ground much better than it used to be in the middle ages. Uh, but it does occasionally still happen. Cantharias is usually uh, occurs in infants, like you see there's a diaper. Um, they have um, yeah, the, the flower that they're properly milled or something like that, or um, uncooked cereals or something like that, has the eggs of the uh, beetle inside them. And so they go into the stomach and for some reason they don't die, uh, they keep breathing inside the stomach and keep living, so the baby starts passing out either larvae or fully out beetles in their poop. <laughs> it's usually self-correcting because the, the larvae don't have any idea what they're doing in there in the first place and they try and crawl out on their own. Otherwise, you know, just a good trip to the doctor will resolve it. Um, Scarabiasis, the second one, uh, is even rarer and it usually involves dung beetles. Uh, so they're harmless, completely harmless little beetles um, that go for dung on the ground and roll it up into balls so their larvae can eat it. This is just basically the dung beetle going to the source of the dung instead of on the ground and goes, hmm, look at that big animal up there. Climbs up and goes into the anus and lays its eggs in the dung inside of the anus. Occasionally it happens to feed. Um, yeah. There's a famous case involving an Indian man in the 1980s who passed both grubs and adult beetles in his feces for over a year. Um, it's highly unusual and some people still think it was faking it somehow. Um, it doesn't do any real harm because they're not deliberately parasitizing, but it can cause the formal discomfort and bowel um, problems. Uh, again, just go to the doctor and they can uh, give you medicine or kill them. With no problems. Here we have the Ewings. This one is a bit of a subversion uh, in that uh, Axine Esau was thought for decades to be a parasite, but just recently we found out it isn't. Uh, it's an extremely highly modified Ewing that's found in Indonesia. It lives in caves where bats are, and it's on the bats and around the bats. And so people naturally assume for a while, oh, they're drinking the bats' blood. But what they're doing is they're using the bat to take them to the real food, which is bat flies and lice and fleas that are eating the bat, uh, they eat them. So this is not really a parasite, it's a symbiote. It's um, actually helping the bat. So bats that have these are actually doing better because they don't have as many parasites. So that was a fake one, unfortunately. However, this one, which is associated with, with rodents in Africa, yeah, it's, a, it's called a rat view. It, 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 it basically exclusively parasitizes an animal called the giant African pouch rat, which is used by um, uh, the UN to detect landmines in Africa, because uh, they have a good sense of smell, they're too light to uh, set the mines off. Um, so again, they have the characteristic flattening. The pincers that you usually see on earrings are, are not really pincers anymore, they're just like CSC, which they use to detect living animals. Uh, this one's not a living insect, it's a pink specimen. Um, and they don't have the eyes, so you've got like, dozens of them may infect or infest a one particular rat. Um, and then uh, they'll, this one does sometimes kill its host because they get infected in so many, um, so many big numbers that it dies of anemia. And which one will pour out of the rat and find the nearest rat around the double net instead? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Not, not terrible, but uh, only. They only goes for one particular type of rat, so humans are okay for the long, long run. Anyway. Um, that's about it for the um, insects, the parasites and parasitoids. However, just to wrap things up, I have some fictional examples <laughs> that you might be familiar with. Arkin's face from Doctor Who. They have the worm. That's the difference. <laughs> uh, yes, it is bringing bubble rat, which wasn't common when it was made in, uh, in uh, 1970. Uh, Five. Yeah, it beat Alien to the punch by about five years and Aliens to about a full ten. Um, yeah, you've got uh, the Doctor, the fourth Doctor, 
and Sarah and Harry who turn up on the space station, um, which is, has all the remaining humans left in cryo, left on Earth in cryostasis after an astronomic event almost killed everybody. Unfortunately, the worm found it first, and um, they're basically gigantic wasp mantis things that use with sleeping humans in the cryogenic chambers as their own personal food source for their larvae, and uh, that happens. <laughs> so the worm basically. Uh, take over the station gradually, uh, person by person, until the doctor discovers that they are fatally damaged by electricity. And we'll go from there. Next up, we have a more modern doctor to the left with the time beacon, which a lot, not myself and my uh, entomologist friends were delighted by because it looks so awesomely realistic. And then they had to turn over and the legs were on the abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, turn left, uh, the time beetle feeds on energy displaced from a potential life, life cycle that has not been used. So it makes Donna have a critical life decision. She turns to the, turns to the left when she should turn to the right, and basically the universe implodes because because of that one decision, the doctor dies, um, the Daleks invade the Earth, uh, people put in concentration camps. Basically Donna is the most important person on the face of the Earth. The, the time bill feeds really well, but it um, kind of screws up the timeline to such a degree that the doctor has to destroy it. Um, yeah. Next up, Star Trek Next Generation Conspiracy. We have the Neural Parasite. Um, this was an early episode, it still actually is quite creepy. Um, it basically deals with a cabal of uh, uh, Starfleet admirals who have been infected by this insectile creature that lives on the spinal column underneath the just underneath the top of the skull. Uh, it gives a massively powerful strength, hugely augmented strength, uh, intelligence and speed, at the cost that it slowly kills them by uh, draining all of their spinal fluid. And uh, yeah, um, Picard and his crew find out that this is happening and they're going to stop it. It, it has a show-stopping finale with a giant queen parasite inside the belly of, one of a mycarabin that they use the phases on kill on, which is the first time ever shown the full kill of the phase that you just basically explore this. Um, unfortunately, the part three is ridiculous. But the rest of X Files. That is it that Mescular took the kissing bug and ran with it. This is a kissing bug that will kill you straight away uh, from a heart attack. Um, basically, a uh, South American parasitic kissing bug that um, gets into your body, under your skin, causes pustules that grow with its larvae. The pustules burst, and if there's anyone around you, they get showered with larvae, and um, yeah, then you're infected. The pustules burst and kill you. So it's basically a contagious parasitoid running around this um, old prison in Arkansas. Uh, Scully is uh, assigned there and potentially infected. We don't know until the end because she's not infected. She lasted for 11 seasons. Um, but uh, yeah, um, all the parasite, parasitic bugs using it were real. They were actual kissing bugs, not the deadly kind, of course, uh, but so they actually had them crawling all over Scully at one point, or Joy Anderson, and the other actors. Russell didn't mind this. Uh, she said herself to me, as I said, if it had been snakes, she would have been screaming, but she didn't mind the insects. Um, next up. Hello. Okay. Please. Uh, having a session where, you know, prison was a genius for her choice, uh, <laughs> because prisons are frequently, basically, infected with bed bugs mm. or around typhus bearing uh, lice, and what not do the pianos for our population they can't go anywhere. Yeah, they can't go anywhere. It's, yeah. it's, in full. it's a buffet for the parasitic the insects. Yeah. And it's the first, uh, it turns out there's the consortium that was doing it's the first major move from the cigarette smoking man and it's like, hey look here I am with my cigarette. Um, next up, another more recent one, Folio Do. It's which is slightly less realistic, just a little. <laughs> um, Human-sized giant bug that uh, doesn't kill you, it bites you on the back of the neck and you die, but it reanimates you as a zombie slave and gets you to do whatever, whatever zombie slaves do, I guess. Um, they can actually get it in game, really. It's just like, yeah, I've made an army of zombie slaves. Um, but uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Mondo goes, here's the only one who can see it. Usually one or two people in its office environment where it hangs out in offices, you, one or two people can see it. They are committed, and the bug follows them into the asylum and has a buffet of mental patients. Um, Mulder's committed, the bug follows him, 
Um, he's going, there's a giant bug coming to kill me. And everyone's like, sure there is, Mulder, sure there is. Um, eventually Skinner believes him and almost gets his head bitten off. But uh, they shoot it at the last minute. But um, not reading it, it's Miranda writes fast, which is probably a violation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fairly out there episode, but um, yeah, it, it's, um, it works because this suit was replaced at the last minute by CGI, which looks a lot better and more convincing. Um, I don't know what they were smoking when they made that suit, but uh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, so it works for the CGI effects, it works for um, you know, David Duchovny's performance, and um, you know, it's chilling predicament of off this environment created today by Jeff Bezos. Um, so, the last one, you might have played this, I don't know, Resident Evil 4, The Lost Plagas Parasite. This is only one of the forms. It's an insectile parasite from the Cambrian, no, not Cambrian, uh, prehistory around the Jurassic era. Um, it's been with us for centuries. Sinister cabal of insectile people uh, going around Spain recruiting people in this cult. Uh, the president's daughter, US president's daughter, uh, has a plane accident, gets kidnapped by the cult in Spain. He has to go in and rescue them. And then it turns out it's all been orchestrated so that they can implant the para para parasite into the president's daughter and children back and infect America. And presumably their stock prices will go up. I don't know, they haven't really mentioned why it would be so good. 